Now, when they become highly inflamed, if there's high levels of lipid or cholesterol, they begin to burn out. And they deposit cholesterol ester. And this is how plaque builds up. So now we're from the third decay, our 30 and 40 year olds, we're getting into our fourth decay and closer to our 50 year olds. 59 is the age when the highest amount of cardiac sudden death occurs. And it occurs because of plaque ruptures. A plaque rupture is an inflammatory event that is superimposed upon high levels of cholesterol and high levels of risk. Now, the important point to take home is this. The more risk factors you have, the higher your risk of having trouble later on. I would expect that every one of you in this room has gotten a lecture from your doctor at least once to that effect. Is that correct? Can I see a show of hands? I didn't see too many hands go up. <laughs> I hope that's better. But the point, the point really is, is that, and, and this is what you need to understand, higher the lipids, the worse the blood pressure, the worse the diabetes, the more you smoke, the more likelihood you're going to have trouble. And as I showed you just a minute ago, next slide, the more psychosocial stress, the more you are going to also have increased levels of cardiac events occurring. Now, nocturnal angina is described as chest pain that occurs in the middle of the night. I'm sure some of you have woken up with chest pain in the middle of the night. Hopefully, it's that you just need to go take a Tums and everything's going to be okay. Other times, it really heralds a pretty serious event. And there are multiple causes of why people will develop chest pain in the middle of the night. And they are because of obstructive sleep apnea. You know, everybody's learning about sleep now, and uh, people have to wear certain devices to help them. There are surges that occur in REM sleep of the nervous system that just discharge. Sleep is the repository of where your daily activities go. I'm sure every single one of us in this room has had the experience of at least lying in bed once at night where we couldn't go to sleep, where we just twisted and turned for various reasons. Now usually it comes from some anxiety. We're worried about something, something's on our mind. Some people may have been kept up by a dripping faucet. Some people may have been kept up by other types of happenstances. But what I would like you to understand is that sleep is a very pre precious commodity. And if it is disordered, it leads to further heart problems. Next slide. Now, this is a very complex slide. But basically, what this slide is telling you is that there are significant interactions that occur with the mind and the body as I pointed out before. And these are very well-defined physiological pathways. By physiological pathways, I mean how the body works to affect different types of heart functions. So that if you get really wired and jacked, your heart is affected by your autonomic nervous system and begins to move very fast. For some people, they get a lot of fright and their heart goes Fans. For some people, they get flight where they want to withdraw and they go, oh my god, this is, and then they get faint and they pass out. <clears throat> this is germane to our topic tonight because if you don't get enough sleep at night, it really leads to a disordering of all of the functioning of your cardiovascular system to some degree. Everybody's different. Some people are affected more, some people are affected less. Okay? And this also affects stress hormones. It affects those white blood cells, the immune cells that I was talking to you about, which then affect the blood vessels, which also affect the platelets, which are those little sticky things that we try to prevent by putting people on aspirin and on other medications. So, next slide. It underscores that if you do not get good sleep, you are going to have increased risk. Just like if you eat poorly, you're going to have increased risk from heart disease as well. Our sleep, our eating, our drinking, our emotional lives, these, this is the stuff of what makes heart disease 
which is the number one killer in this country. Over a million people die every year of heart attacks. And it requires an enormous amount of effort to manage it. So this is a paper that was just published in June of, 19, of 2009, this past year. It comes out of Harvard University. And what they did in this paper was to summarize the cardiovascular inflammatory, as I pointed out to you, and metabolic consequences of sleep deprivation. And what this paper did was to review all of the literature that has been written about that shows why worsening sleep may have a profound effect on your heart. Now, sleep also has effects on other disease states, but as a cardiologist, I'm just going to speak to that which I know about. Next slide. Now, this is another paper, and the title of this paper is called The Effect of Sleep Loss on C-Reactive Protein, an Inflammatory Marker of Cardiovascular Risk. This is an important paper because it underscores that inflammation. Remember the slide I showed you about those white cells and its relationship to the development of plaque and ultimately the plaque rupture. So, if you have sleep loss, your C-reactive protein, which is a blood test, which is a marker, rises. And many of you probably have had a C-reactive protein taken by your doctors because that um, does give some indication as to whether or not you need to be treated more aggressively for your risk factors. Next slide. So what does this have to do with wind turbines? Why am I up here talking about this tonight? There's been a lot, a lot of talk about health issues and wind turbines and what they do. And I'll be really quite honest with you. Many of those questions about wind turbines are ones that I couldn't answer nor would I try to answer. But I am really confident and able to answer questions regarding the issues around sleep. Now there's a doctor up in Morris Hill, Maine who did a very small study. This is not a major scientific study. These just are not available when it comes yet to the health consequences of wind. Now, in Dr. Nissenbaum's study, he did a controlled study. He asked people who lived within 1,100 meters of wind turbines a variety of questions. He then went out to 5,500 meters, so about five times the distance, and asked, those, asked the same questions to a control group. And I will emphasize to you, these aren't large numbers but they're striking conclusions that merit further attention. Let me say that again. It merits further attention. Do not ignore studies like this. So 82% of the people who lived within 1,100 yards of the wind turbines reported worsened sleep disturbances compared to 3% of the control. Those are big numbers. His stuff is available uh, online, by the way. 36% reported headaches, 55% reported stress, anger, and worsened depression. 95% of the subjects perceived a reduced quality of life. Underlying these findings, 25 new prescription medications were offered to study subjects, of which 15 were accepted compared to four. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say that this represents a population group or statistical significance which is really how we practice medicine. But it's a very interesting initial observational study. It's really probably the first one that's been done. If you go online, there is so much stuff on the potential health effects and uh, through various different organ systems. But I think that we really need to pay some attention to this. Because if we're going to, we're at the very beginning of the issue of uh, wind turbines in this state. There are very few projects. The one down in Searsburg is a very small project. Turbines are very small. The ones we're talking about now are really quite large. And so I believe from this initial type of information that we should just be really careful about how we go about planning this so that we do not begin to run into problems that are initially suggested by this Mars Hill um, information. Now, what else do we have to go on that there are concerns that people raise about living near wind turbines and health? And what we really only have are the voices of those people who have stated that they have suffered because they have lived near turbines. Those voices need to be heard. They also need to be validated.